Oui, oui. De toute façon, tu pas un bus de nouveau Moi, je pars en bus. Ouais. Ouais. Alors, il maîtrise le bus, il les horaires de ça. Ok. Calculé pour, normalement. Et on te voit direct au Bayonne Oui. Direct au Bayonne. Ah, d'accord. Ok. C'est quoi que tu as pris, un bus euh... Welcome back, everybody. Elsa Affleck. Um, we are now going to enter our final panel um, before, round table, rather before uh, the, the ending of the conference, before the closing session. Um, my name is John Edwards. I am the Secretary General of Urashi, which is the European Association for Applied Higher Education in Brussels. And we've been following the um, European Universities Initiative uh, closely since uh, the beginning. Uh, and now uh, we're going to have a discussion among four of the European University Alliances um, that were selected in the second call and who now uh, are going to enter hopefully the, the second phase, having responded to the, the call for, for, for uh, funding, uh, continued funding. I think there was 26 applications, but uh, mostly from all the uh, existing alliances. And I think there was f almost 40 applications for new alliances. But uh, I think we, we have the four here, so it's... Um, and, and light, ECTU, UNITA, and UDRES, I think, yeah? But there are others I know in the room. Uh, so I want you to all chip in and ask questions as well, okay? I think there are other alliances. I know we Anna and um, Agostina here from the, the there, there they are. They, they, they've just got a new alliance <coughs> uh, uh, set up just now. And uh, along with three others, there were in fact four, I didn't even know this until I came here, the, the, the most recent alliances, there's four of them, all coordinated by the Spanish uh, institutions. So it's a bit of a Spanish armada sort of taking over the, the, uh, the, the, the initiative. But that's, um, but, I mean, that's good. And I think in September, there will be a forum for the European Universities Alliances in, under the Spanish presidency of the, of the uh, Council of the European Union. So uh, hopefully we'll see you. you <coughs> Um, but I would just like to, before I start, say uh, congratulations for the conference uh, to everybody uh, who organised it here in, um, in the in University of the Basque Country. This issue of impact is, is very important, both the research but also the, the, the education aspect uh, and the transnational cooperation. And I think the European Commission will like that and uh, they will like the fact that you've organised this. I do know that the European Commission wants certain themes uh, to be... Um, to be to be analysed within the alliances, kind of creating hubs amongst the alliances for different um, for different subjects. So impact is one of those. And uh, congratulations to you know it's not only relevant for Enlight, but it's relevant for, for for the other alliances. Similarly, and if anyone's interested, Urashi is coordinating a hub on applied. Uh, the applied higher education, so sort of work-based learning and cooperation with industry and how we can um, work cooperatively, transnationally in the context of the alliances. So that's just my short introduction. Uh, we can go now to the presentations and each one will have 10 minutes, more or less, please, if you can keep to time. Um, I am, by the way, uh, English and now since 2016, the Brexit referendum. I'm also Portuguese, and although, <laughs> and although I my Portuguese, I'm, I picked up a few. I live in Portugal as well. I, I picked up a few Portuguese habits. One of them that I haven't picked up on is timing. Uh, I still retain uh, um, uh, a, a concern for time. So please uh, stick to your ten minutes, and I will let you know if you are running over, um, because that way we get a good uh, a good chunk of time to discuss amongst ourselves, but more importantly, from you. So get your questions prepared, please, while the, um, the panelists are speaking. So we'll start with Igor Campillo, who, as I said, already congratulated the organizers, including Igor. I've met Igor a long time ago uh, when I was working for the Joint Research Center because, in case you haven't seen it, this is not only European, uh, part of European University Alliance, but part, uh, a Spanish center of excellence. And that's how I met Igor, who has you know, done some fantastic things on challenge-based um, uh, research over the years. So please, Igor, you can have your 10 minutes, and I think we're going to stand up, the speakers, for the, for the presentations. Thank you, Jan. OK. Um, OK. 
So first of all, I would like to thank the Enlight community for your response to our call for this uh, conference. We are very honored to have so many people from the different <coughs> nine universities that are making Enlight. Second, I would like to, to thank also all the people that are not from Enlight but has, that have joined us. So thank you very much because this makes a truly you know, open conference. And I would like to have uh, an applause for the team that it is behind uh, this conference, for Gloria, for Inigo, for Marta. Marta, for Amaya, for Sara, and for Ichaso, who are, you know, behind the scenes making this uh, possible. Well, you see, the, well, I have an advantage over the other speakers because yesterday our coordinator, Guido, uh, gave a detailed and comprehensive presentation of, of Enlight, so I can skip uh, that part and go directly into impact, but I would like to highlight something. Uh, if there is a difference in the, tit in the title, uh, Guido's presentation was Enlight, an impact-driven university. And my title is slightly different, maybe more humble, moving towards an impact-driven <laughs> university. Okay, so I will skip uh, this and I will go directly into impact, okay? And I would like to start with uh, the definition of impact that we have adopted, that we have uh, integrated in, in our uh, alliance. And you can see here uh, the definition, also the definition of impact assessment below that. And First of all, I would like to highlight that you won't see anything related to quality assurance, to indicators, to communication and outreach, to engagement. Although those uh, things are really necessary to build robust impact pathways that we have seen uh, during these past days. So impact, it is related to effects and changes. And uh, you can recognize also uh, some formulations that we saw yesterday in, in different presentations, particularly that of the, of the REF, because, well, it is mostly the same, but we have adapted the, um, the definition and we have included an in, you know, effects or changes that we can see in and beyond academia. We have included the in. This is for two reasons. First of all, because academia and we understand institution-wide students, academics, staffs, leader structures that we have in our universities are also societal stakeholders, are also societal actors, okay? So we have to include them in our analysis. And we have to keep in mind also that uh, in this initial stage of Enlight, uh, most of the effort, most of the transformative effort is directed towards our institutions. So we are the main stakeholder uh, of the endeavor that we are doing in Enlight, and particularly, I think, in all the university alliances that we have here. This is why, in our definition, we have this in. Of course, the beyond is uh, straightforward, because we are expecting to have impact, to have effects and changes, irreversible changes in society and uh, in environment, in the economy. But we have to also look inwards, <coughs> because uh, we need to transform ourselves to become really transformative uh, entities. Then I would like also to, to move to the definition of what an impact-driven university is. And we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we published uh, a letter, a short letter, in the section campus of the Times Higher Education, in which we introduced the definition of uh, an impact-driven uh, university. I won't go into the definition itself, but I would like to say something. This is a process of uh, opening up universities, okay? Uh, universities are mainly uh, focused on knowledge, but when we are speaking about impact-driven universities, knowledge is not enough. Universities are no longer temples of knowledge. We don't have the monopoly of knowledge, and this uh, being an impact-driven university is more about the value that we are creating on the one hand and how we are creating the knowledge as well in cooperation with other agents. So it's a process of moving from being self-centered entities uh, towards working for society, towards working for and with society, and I would add another stage, which is 
working within society. So we are moving from the so-called ivory tower, okay, to the entrepreneurial university, to the engaged civic university, to another state, I don't know how to call this, maybe entangled university, <laughs> in which we have a double process of inside out and outside in, okay? So, uh, yesterday, we saw that uh, in order to, 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 to be impactful, in order to build robust impact pathways in our organizations, we need three things. And this is what we could show yesterday in Roundtable 1 and Roundtable 2. We need leadership, we need strategy, and we need capacities. There is not a single recipe, but these are key three ingredients in order to move towards an uh, uh, impact-driven university. And those ingredients, these ingredients, leadership, capacities, and strategy, they must be activated in order to provoke uh, impact awareness, or to raise impact awareness. This is the understanding and internalizing of the importance of impact and the external con context and the institutional commitment towards having to provide value to society. Of course, we need to acquire and expand impact literacy, the knowledge, the competences, the skills. We have seen this in the pitches this morning because we need to train our people in order to think differently, in order to acquire and incorporate some skills, some you know, key concepts that can help them to build robust or to design robust impact pathways. And the, the, the other thing that we need is to have uh, impact readiness. And this is more related to the preparedness and willingness to, uh, to be impact driven and to have all the internal mechanisms, all the uh, internal support in order to, uh, that our researchers, they don't work alone in impact. This is a collective endeavor, it's an institutional endeavor. So we need to build this capacity. So we need this leadership strategy and capacities. Leadership at different levels, inspirational leadership to provoke that impact awareness, educational leadership and operational leadership to being able to carry out, you know, uh, all related to that. We need the capacities, of course, we need, uh, and then we need a strategy, a strategy with a clear vision, with objectives, with values, and this uh, strategy can be, as we saw yesterday, this can be something that we have done uh, in a very specific, dedicated way, or can be the emergent strategy out of the different capacities and connections that we can activate, you know, in our uh, institutions. So these are the key three ingredients and the three levels that we need in order to move towards an impact-driven university. And now we can go to Enlight. What are we doing in Enlight? So Enlight uh, is a well, it's moving towards being an impact-oriented alliance, and we have two articulating projects that were presented yesterday by, by Guido, and in those projects we have two clear uh, objectives. One is related to the creation, to the development of a comprehensive methodology and tools for measuring, for addressing, for assessing, for capturing the long-term impact, long impact on light on different stakeholders, and the other objective which is also a comprehensive uh, objective, is to explore the frontiers of a common uh, impact-driven research and innovation agenda. And of course, we have built our own theory of change to move towards this impact-driven university. Don't worry, I won't go into all these details here, but I can <laughs> assure you that uh, the three expected outcomes of our theory of change are to raise impact awareness, to acquire impact literacy, and to develop impact readiness. So this means that we try to provoke a shift, a shift in our way of thinking as, as our universities, how we perceive ourselves, how we think about ourselves, how we see our role in society, and a shift in our way of acting, how we are going to operate. Okay? And of course, there is a desired impact, but I will go at the end of the presentation towards that. And, well, what, what, he, what uh, have we achieved so far? in this two-year period of our uh, projects. Well, again, all those things that you see here, these outputs and activity are, you know, contributing to achieve these expected outcomes that I was mentioning before. For example, this Enlight Impact Conference is one activity, is one output, and it is intended to raise impact awareness 
in our community. It's also intended to uh, expand this impact literacy because we are learning a lot during these uh, two days. And of course, this will you know, uh, make us eager to be impact-driven. Impact then we have, uh, we have built uh, a live repository of good practices on research impact. This is available online. This is publicly available. And this is related to the awareness and to the literacy. We have been surveying our universities uh, several times. And out of that, we have been able to map how literate our institutions are regarding impact. And we have developed out of it uh, a toolkit for self-assessment for our uh, university research impact awareness, literacy, and readiness. And this is also available online, as Esther announced yesterday. And we have been uh, developing, as I said, a methodology approach, methodological approach, and a first toolkit for impact assessment. And I will stop here with the methodology, because I think probably is uh, one of the most important outcomes that we, sorry, outputs that we are having. I have to be very precise with outputs, outcomes, impact. <laughs> Two more minutes, please. Two more minutes, yes, I will finish. So here you can see the methodological approach that we have adopted, that we have, what we are using now in light. And again, you can recognize, you know, the different things, content that we saw yesterday, okay? First, this is a, a sequential process in a circular approach. We first start by setting the intention. This was mentioned yesterday. Then we have the scope definition, which is something, you know, at the very beginning, we have to identify and prioritize the stakeholders, to build the theory of change, to uh, establish the framework in which we are uh, doing the, the, the impact assessment, and to uh, build the indicators, okay? Then we have to collect the data. This is not straightforward, as you already know. Then we have to analyze the value. The, out of those data, we have to see if, uh, what the outcomes are as we saw yesterday, positive or negative, intended or unintended. So this is something that we have to, to, to take into account. And then the idea is to build the narratives of change that we can uh, have out of everything. And this is very important for communication purposes. Yesterday, Leire highlighted this idea that uh, talking about impact is talking about communication as well. And the last stage is the beginning of the next cycle, which is somehow how all these indicators, these narratives that we have captured are helping us making decisions for the next stage. How we can use that to maximize, minimize positive, negative impacts uh, respectively. So this is uh, exactly how we are working. And uh, we are doing this uh, as an action research project within Enlight, because we are using different action lines of Enlight in order to, to test and to refine and sharpen this methodological approach. And we have selected out of the different, uh, well, outcomes, yesterday Guido mentioned all these, we have selected the, the ones that we consider as most, most transformative of the, uh, of the projects. And with all those, uh, those action lines, we have converted them into case studies. And in such a way that we have started a co-creative process with the community, okay? With the community and with external stakeholders. So I'm, I'm very sorry for the other World Package leaders because we are always trying to meet them in order to check, contrast what we are doing, but we are building with them and with external stakeholders also and with the students, you know, the theory of change, the indicators, and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details, but this is an ongoing process right now. And uh, well, I will finish here, I will stop here. All these, the next stage, you know, we are, you know, facing four more years, hopefully, uh, since uh, from October on. And the idea is that uh, we can promote and institutionalize the culture of impact. Our desired impact with all this activity is to provoke a shift in our way of being as universities, so in such a way that we can have, you know, this culture of impact and depth in our institutions. And of course, the idea, behind this is that we can extend this as a role model for the uh, larger uh, uh, European higher education area. And eventually, we will be able to claim that we are an impact-driven alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Igor. Um, that was a good start to, to things, putting it all in context. We are talking, uh, uh, after all, about impact, although I believe that we are 
well, here we got impact from Unita, but we're going to have more of a general overview. Let's see. Okay. But let's uh, see. it's over to you. And Ernesto is is from France. Yes. In fact, well, you're almost playing at home, I think, here because you are from the French Basque country. Exactly. Right? Yes. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> neighbors. We, we, yeah, <laughs> close by. And uh, and but you're not you're originally Venezuelan. So yes, you've got an exactly. interesting mixture. Yes. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, about Unita. Great. Thank okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, thank you for this conference. I would like to really thank you because I think this is, we are creating impact uh, if between our alliance and working in this together, sharing uh, best practices. And in my presentation, I would like just to give you a global overview about the approach that we are uh, uh, following for UNITA. And as uh, Igor did, uh, perhaps we need to start uh, sharing our understanding about impact, how we are dealing with impact. <coughs> Before uh, showing you the, let's say, the mission, uh, long-term visions of our alliance. Uh, similar, as Igor presented, we are uh, trying to uh, uh, achieve these long-term effects that we hope that are going to be durable during the time, and of course, positive. Then. This, this will be the global, the global goal, mission of our, uh, of our alliance. But we know that we're going to have sometimes unexpected uh, uh, results, uh, impact, effects, uh, that are not intended and that, that are not direct, uh, but regarding the activities that we are planning. Uh, then, that's why it's important to show you this uh, Map. I need to do it because uh, you know very well in light, but perhaps less UNITA. But I am doing it also to show you the original idea to create this ecosystem that our goal is to allow this direct and indirect, and direct, and directed, sorry, intended, unexpected, expected, unexpected effects, long term effects. The numbers are important 250,000 students, 21,000 staff. Uh, but it, we're starting getting into the DNA of our alliance. Our alliance is, there is a very important point, is based on uh, one ecosystem where we have Romance language countries. Then we are sharing cultural uh, specificities, we are uh, sharing uh, common culture, and we are sharing a common language or common roots of language. And this is very important because in some way we are trying to develop an existing ecosystem, putting together this ecosystem. We are also located in areas that are cross-border. This is also very important that we are uh, used to collaborate between universities on the borders. It's the case, for example, with the UP, UPV, University of Vasco, that we are doing collaboration for a lot of years already. And, of course, we have uh, thematics, as all the alliance. In our case, is renewable energy, cultural heritage, and circular economy to create this uh, European university. When we, are, we were applying to the second phase of the alliance, and we were thinking about the expansion, we said we need to keep this DNA. Then at the beginning, we were already two, two universities in France working together and really working very well together because we are coping sometimes with the same difficulties, same opportunities, and we are working together to try to take decisions. Then this was the approach for the expansion. Then today we have two uh, universities per country in these five countries, and we have two associated partners in Switzerland and in Ukraine. Okay, let's go and talk about impact. I have four slides because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, then we are following a, a standard approach. Uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers, but let's go and start with the first one. The first one, our main impact, is creating these architectural foundations for our alliance, our ecosystem. Then, as I explained to you, we have these uh, 250,000 students almost and 21,000 staff that are going to be uh, collaborating. They are, they are going to be identifying the opportunities. The idea is to be attractive internally in our regions, in our countries, but also uh, between our universities, attractivity for our community attractivity also at the level of Europe, and of course beyond. Then we have followed the same approach, and we have been creating an external extra-European network. The name is Geminae. We have actually 32 partners, 
coming again from uh, countries from Romance language in America, South and North, and Africa, South and North. Then the idea is to create, this was for us the first very important impact. In two years and a half, we cannot do, we cannot do miracles, you know, it's, it's not possible. But what we are uh, here trying to target is to create this architectural foundation for the ecosystem, attractivity uh, between our universities in Europe and beyond. The second uh, slide is more related to, okay, now we have the ecosystem, how this community is going to work together. Then for us, this is very important. They, we need to uh, create mobility, but not just mobility. I mean, we really need to move to do something together. Then, uh, for example, we have developed a very inter interesting sorry, instrument called intercomprehension tools. These are tools that are developed by researchers and teachers in our universities to allow people that they don't speak French, Spanish, Italian, but they have already one Romance language, to have a just very basic levels to start understanding each other, at least when they are sharing a beer. You know, it's not just uh, working, really working, but in an informal communication, and perhaps going further. Also giving a lot of support for linguistic uh, um, learning language, you know, I'm imagining that the students in two or three years, they're going to start doing double degrees, not only in English. Of course, we're using English as a medium of instruction and, and work, but the idea is to really develop our, our language, develop the different activities in our language. Uh, the third slide is, now we have our community, we are allowing this community to e uh, know each other because they can understand each other, they can communicate, they can, they can start doing work. Now, let's go and start doing work. Let's go and start having results. Then, we have created one instrument called Matching Events. Matching Events is an is a, um, opportunity to get uh, a lot of people, could be uh, teachers, could be researchers, could be the staff. And the idea is we, for example, two weeks ago we were in Torino, and we were 160 teachers, uh, bachelor uh, and uh, master level, even PhD level. And we were trying to meet each other, discuss about what we're doing, trying also to learn about models for international collaboration. And at the end, we were uh, working in projects that we can develop together. We are doing the same for education. Uh, and, of, of course, for research. We did that for research. We have today a cartography of researchers in our thematics areas where researchers have, have uh, declared, these are my competencies and I would like perhaps to work with other researchers in the community, for example, in the framework of projects. We created also a protocol of cotutelas. Then we have 32 cotutelas, a cotutela that is a, a protocol that it can be applied to any of our countries, our universities that are working together. Um, Okay, and we are doing also, we are interconnecting services, teaching and learning centers, uh, linguistic centers. I mean, having really this community working together and developing common tools. The last slide is more regarding sustainability. Um, of course, we are uh, doing all these things, but we need to project in the long term uh, actions that are going to be, be allowing us to continue doing this work and having real impact. Then we created this concept of constellation projects. Then our, our idea is uh, we are not going to be opportunists. We need to really be pragmatic, but at the same time, work together in creating the right uh, environment to develop a specific actions that we cannot do in the Erasmus Plus in, uh, European Initiative Project. Then for that, we have created uh, actually five uh, constellation projects. One oriented in research structures, one in innovation, one in digital education, the other is more networking of researchers, uh, and a very important one is legal entity. Legal entity is something very important for the long term. We have already created a legal entity in 2022 at the end of the year. <coughs> we have voted this uh, status in our universities, and we are in the process of really developing this legal entity that for the moment is an European uh, interest group, economic interest group, but we, uh, we um, answer to the pilot uh, of legal entities, the pilot, to move this approach to academic uh, interest group. 
Okay, then, uh, this is the last one. <laughs> then, where we are now, of course, we are doing all these things, but it's not easy. You know, you are in Alliance. It's not really easy. Uh, we have having a uh, huge challenge, for example, in communication. We still have students, they don't know anything about European Alliance. Also, uh, staff. It's quite complex. It's very difficult. Then communication is a real uh, difficulty. It, still, we have two years and a half, but we, have, we are trying, we are trying, but it's not easy. Also, the right assessment and measuring system, this is also very difficult to find, to develop between all our universities, is quite complex. Then, what we are planning for the next phase? Actually, we are trying to develop um, one, this is going to be probably a new project of the Constellation. This is going to be a collect, coll um, collaborative intelligence space, uh, like Wikipedia, you know? Then the idea is to have all the, all the definition, the semantics of our tools, of our uh, missions, our goals, our actions, our results, are going to be in a common uh, semantic uh, data definition. And at the same time, these common elements are going to be enriched with the actions that we're doing, with the results that we're doing, with the dates when we're doing the things, the results that we're getting, and we can measure at the long-term impact. Then it's going to be a digital solution is going to be uh, based on um, um, semantic shading, but at the same time, data collection, uh, transformation of the data to information, and from information to knowledge. And globally, this is going to be using uh, business analytics, business intelligence approach, uh, and even data mining, because we can also identify possibilities to allow our community to collaborate. And this is the first, the, the next. One minute. Okay, but actually I finished. Okay. This, is, this is our approach. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Well, Ernesto, thank you for sticking to time very well. Um, and I like the sort of territorial, cultural, cross-border element of your uh, alliance. It's uh, very interesting. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll go now to the third... Um, Alliance, third speaker, Heather Hunt, from University of Poitiers, yeah. um, uh, but a uh, member of the ECTU Alliance, and Heather's like me, you're a kind of adopted European. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, way welcome here, and Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, thank you to everybody here. Thank you to Ernesto for a great presentation. I'm going to take... Oops, a daisy. <laughs> I'm going to talk about how the EC2 Alliance tracks progress and impact currently. So I'll start with presenting um, a few elements about the EC2 Alliance. I'll go on to our cycle of improvement, and then I'll talk about the external impact. Let me introduce you to Manon Colombo. She's a student of the University of Poitiers who has been directly impacted by the EC2 Alliance. She joined us in 2021 in the EC2 Forum, the first physical event we had. By 2022, Manon had been appointed EC2 student representative, meaning that she was the connection between the local community and the governing bodies. She also created a local association to lead activities in Poitiers. As of today, she is an instrumental member in the European Student Assembly to redesign policy with students for students. The EC2 Alliance impacted Manu. She's there in the front, she's really smiley. <laughs> um, with the opportunities that the EC2 Alliance provided her, she had access to a European network. She developed transversal skills, and I think we have helped her um, in her career path. I asked Manu what the EC2 Alliance meant to her. And she said to create a pan-European campus, to create stronger ties, and I couldn't agree more. Very briefly, the EC2 Alliance is composed of seven universities across Europe. But more importantly, the EC2 Alliance touches over, or reaches, over 9,000 teachers and researchers, 11,000 staff, 160,000 students, and over 1,600,000 citizens. 
The EC2 Alliance's activities are centered around United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, making our activities relevant and impactful. These three UN SDGs were selected according to already existing research areas of the universities. So, um, approximately 1,221, to be precise, articles had been published um, between 2008 and 2019. So we have three virtual institutes, which are research labs without physical walls, if you will, centered around the elements of the knowledge square. And three EC2 joint master programs that were um, accredited um, and opened in September 2022. But of course, as all alliances, it's about connecting people. And this is done via cultural activities, um, tools at the service of our community and the flagship event, the EC2 Forum. And this is a photo from our last event. <coughs> Just then we remember who we are actually working for. So, we've talked about it before, and I think with every European project, the goal is to have a positive impact. And very, very briefly, this can be uh, resumed as a contribution or a significant effect. And the EC2 Alliance adopts a holistic approach to this, from outcomes to optimization, internal and external impact, and short to midterm, when relevant, um, uh, analysis. I don't have a lot of time to go into everything, but I wanted to share some practices that we use at the Alliance at different levels and at different stages. So we have, as all alliances, outcomes and outputs that can be translated into deliverables and indicators. Deliverables, proof of actions, indicators, um, results, and performance-oriented. Um, the activities are measured via many tools, but one of them is the global feedback mechanism, which I'll get back into later. The outcomes and outputs, and as well as the measurements, um, go in or are fed directly into the governing bodies, including the Quality Council, which ensures that we adopt a qualitative process throughout every decision the EC2 Alliance makes. And then the Executive Committee, which is the decision-making body of the Alliance. Everything is then optimized. <laughs> Very, very briefly, the Global Feedback Mechanism is an online survey. It's it targets students and staff from across the Alliance. But what is differentiating, I would say, of this survey is that we really engage with the people. Um, we accompany them through the survey and we use it as a learning and dissemination tool. So a lot of information is provided about activities for those who may not be very familiar um, with what we provide. And one of our questions that we asked was the benefits of the European uh, Universities Initiative, which I thought was particularly relevant today. And I think we can all agree that one of the benefits is actually the sharing of knowledge, learning together. And I've exchanged with many of you, and I think that um, I have learned a lot. <laughs> and just to bring it back to Manon, it is via tools like this that we know that we are having an impact, and we can ensure that students share the same, same experience as Manon. We ask open questions, and one of them was, how would people go about improving our communication? And a few responses appear here. If we bring this back to the cycle of improvement, the deliverable can be <coughs> uh, the EC2 communication plan, basically all of the communication activities. We asked people to give their opinion, and one of the, the, their suggestions was a newsletter. The communication plan and the measurements were then given to the governing bodies and decided to actually implement an EC2's newsletter. The first edition was launched in February um, and this will be continued to be optimized and the communication plan will be up updated. Now, to external impact. I'm going to come back to the two main activities that I presented before and start with the joint master programs. As you can imagine, <laughs> implementing joint master programs um, presented a few challenges and opportunities, of course, but um, the EC2 Alliance really strived to make our research or our path towards uh, implementing joint master programs available for all and to share this with the European Commission. We are actively contributing, therefore, to the European approach for accreditation and this can be translated into um, EC2's participation in the Ed Affiche project, so the European Degree Label Call. It will be launched 
officially on the 1st of April, so stay tuned. And this means that we are transforming processes across the European higher education area. Likewise, if we take the joint virtual institutes, by definition, these are creating research and innovation ecosystems. Therefore, increasing research and innovation capacities at a European level. Additionally, EC2U has a sister project, so a Horizon 2020 project called RI4C2, so Research Innovation uh, for Cities and Citizens, which is really leading the Alliance to collaborate with others to create a borderless, challenge-based European research area. I would like to leave you with a few key takeaways. Um, the pilot phase was a learning curve. We learned a lot, mistakes along the way, but positive experiences. And I think one of the things that we learned is that everybody had expertise to share, but to analyze impact and track progress at such a global level meant that we needed to come up with new systems to do so. So here's a quote from Ludovic, uh, the coordinator of the Alliance. And I think it sums up quite nicely. And additionally, um, as coordinator of the student network of the EC2 Alliance, I would like to leave you with a quote from Manon as well to confirm that EC2 will continue striving to have a positive impact on the students, the staff of the Alliance, but also on any person involved within, uh, within the EC2 Alliance. Sorry. So, thank you. Muchas gracias. Brilliant, Heather. Well done, thank you, and thank you for sticking to time. Did I it? did? Yeah, you did it, yeah. <laughs> That's surprising. Within time, so well done. Um, yes, yeah, so now we're going to finish with Hannes Rafazida. Um, Hannes is from University of Applied Sciences in St. Pulten in Austria, coordinates the UDRES Alliance. Um, I'm also very proud to say he's a, a board member of URSHI. Um, and Hannes, I think, is going to be talking, well, well, of course, he's going to be talking about UDRES, but it's the regional impact, I guess, which will come out of this presentation. Um, University of Applied Science are very uh, rooted in their regions, and that is the name of the, uh, the, the regions is, is, is within the name of the alliance. So, Hannes, over to you. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. Congratulations uh, to Gloria, to Igor, to uh, the team. Um, congratulations to Enlight for this inspiring uh, conference. Um, I'm not only an academic and, and manager in higher education, I'm also um, an artist, a composer, and um, sometimes it's much easier to take the perspective of the artist um, because uh, you don't have to prove evidence in this, in this case. Um, and two things I think are very important uh, concerning impact. Uh, first of all, as a composer, I know everything starts with listening not with reading papers, not with keynotes, not with hiding behind screens, um, not with boring meetings, but listening uh, to the people out there, to the colleagues, to the students. Um, second thing, as an artist, I'm absolutely convinced, or not only convinced, I know it, uh, that uh, there are many, many, many things which are uh, unmeasurable. Arts makes the invisible visible. I think this is, at least from my perspective, art uh, stands for. Um, and I think this is definitely uh, true also for, for uh, impact. Um, it's, it's not about uh, evidence, about measuring, but, but uh, really uh, doing these things. And, and think, for instance, of ChatGPT. Do we have evidence that it affects uh, higher education? For sure not after a few months. Um, so we can wait for the next three years until there is evidence. I'm not sure if this is really a good idea. Um, so I'm coming from, from the UDRES Alliance. Many people say this is probably the alliance with the most complicated name. You can say UDRES, you can say OIDRES, you can say ODRES, you can say E3, U, D, C, uh, something. Um, we don't care. Pronounce it whatever you want. Uh, Two things are important. Uh, one is we are E to the power of three, engaged, entrepreneurial, and European. And uh, as John already said, we really focus on the regions. So the squared S in the end is smart and sustainable uh, European regions. 
Um, so so far we started with six universities. Um, we enlarged uh, about a year ago with uh, three more uh, associated partners, hopefully starting in October with uh, these nine full uh, partners. I, I don't go into detail here. Um, what uh, is a fact that we have um, um, seven of these nine are universities of applied sciences, so this is definitely the alliance with most uh, UASs. Um, and none of our um, members is in the capital city. We are in small or medium-sized cities. I think the smallest city in Valmiera in, in Latvia is uh, about 30,000 inhabitants. Uh, the largest is Temeswara in, in Romania, about 300 to 400,000. Um, um, but uh, and, and also comparably small uh, universities. Um, in, in Latvia, they call themselves a micro-university. They do not even have 1,000 students. Uh, the largest is Saxion now in, in, in the Netherlands with about 30,000. Um, so we talk about impact of universities and, with the, and when we talk about impact then we probably uh, come up with, with these uh, ideas uh, from, from the Ivy League and so on. They do not only talk about the Ivory Towers, they have it on their campuses. Um, and I think it's not, we should not uh, shoot on these Ivory Towers. I think we really should care about them. Uh, these are the last really important landmarks for independent and critical thinking out there. So please, please, please preserve these ivory towers, but make a door open. Um, let's build bridges to these ivory towers. Not every uh, university has to be focused on impact. Uh, we need some of them, uh, but we need also some others really focusing on, on, on uh, blue sky research and so on. Um, if we think about the future uh, of universities, about the impact of higher education, um, I was in uh, this ghost town of, of Bodhi on, on the border between um, California and, and Nevada. Um, uh, people left this ghost town uh, about 100 years ago. And you look through the windows to the hotel, to the grocery store, to the school. Then I ask myself, what has changed? Almost nothing in the schools, but also nothing changed in the average universities, to be honest. So, we have to create impact. We have to create impact also on innovation ecosystems. And if we think about innovation, the innovation capacity globally is highly focused in just a few uh, hotspots, uh, let's say. Uh, we know about this. So what about Europe? Um, our answer at UDRES is we really want to impact smart and sustainable European regions as an engaged and entrepreneurial European university. What we have to offer in, in Europe are these diverse uh, regions. Um, and of course, we, we discussed yesterday about barriers and opportunities. And in our group, we said diversity, of course, is a big um, uh, opportunity. And, and if you go to the Silicon Valley and speak with these people, they say diversity is key. This, they say this at least in the second sentence. Um, diversity is key for innovation, uh, for impact. But of course, for us, it's also a barrier somehow. It, it is difficult to bring all these uh, institutions together. So at UDRES, so this slide is somehow messed up, so don't, don't care about it. Um, one thing is important. Uh, we come up with a new um, academic um, uh, culture. Uh, I think this is what we really need. Um, people speak a lot about agile management today, about flat hierarchies, um, and so on and so on. If we think about universities, we are really far, far away from having flat hierarchies, from uh, being somehow agile, and so on. So we definitely need a new uh, academic culture. Uh, we, we call this, this new I culture, inclusive, intense, innovative, inspiring, interactive, and so on. Um, we have to take new perspectives. We need some kind of new formats. We have to keep the ivory towers, but uh, shot, shot on, on our silos, silos of disciplines, silos between uh, the academia and, and the non-academic stuff, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so at UDRES, um, we really try to uh, interrelate uh, our four missions, education, research, innovation, service with and for society. Uh, we try to really knit these um, um, missions together, build bridges um, across the, the various gaps uh, along the knowledge uh, square. Um, so we run boot camps, hackathons, um, uh, living labs, um, and, and uh, what we call i-residences. Um, so students go out to the, the rural areas, uh, students together with uh, uh, researchers, uh, 
try to listen. As I said, it starts, uh, everything starts with listen. Try to listen to the uh, communities um, out there. Um, we also try to join forces with others. So we have uh, our called EINS, uh, UDRES Entrepreneurship and Innovation Network for Smart and Sustainable Regions, where we collaborate with UIN. Um, I'm sure you remember uh, Balshan's uh, talk from UIN uh, yesterday. Um, we start with the leadership. Um, so we have several workshops uh, with, let's say, key innovation leaders, key impact leaders, the leaders of our uh, management. I think it's uh, important uh, when you want to have the change of mindsets that all the leaders really stand uh, fully behind. Um, on the other side, uh, we're really looking for, let's say, testimonials. Um, also, as a composer, yes, I write my scores for the orchestra, but this is nothing without the musicians. You always need the people, for sure. So we go out and, and try to find these testimonials. For instance, we have our testimonial uh, Tuesday presents uh, one, one, I think, pretty cool startup um, a week. We also have what we call inspiring, inspirational uh, chats, um, for instance, of the Entrepreneurial University as a driver for our regions and so on. And, and um, I re really remember one of our meetings with uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel, and she really said uh, it's all about a lead by example. And it's our duty to bring up these examples. So this is what we try to collect and try to share within our alliances and alliance and, and of course across. It's also important to know who are uh, the, the players within our ecosystem. So again, together with UIN, uh, we work on these uh, ecosystem maps, uh, really try to get some more deeper insights. Uh, who are the people out there? Um, what are the challenges? In our specific ecosystems, of course, there are big intercultural differences between Portugal and, and Latvia, Finland and Romania, but uh, always there are also some kind of uh, uh, similarities and, and things which we can do together and where we can learn, uh, but we have to look very closely in these ecosystem maps. Based on this work, we came up with our European network of uh, open uh, innovation hubs, um, so we started regionally anchored uh, open innovation hubs, but connect them on a pan-European level to uh, various um, topics, uh, topics connected uh, closely to the needs of um, our regions. So far, um, we reached um, about 700 plus uh, students really actively involving. We reached much more, but those are really actively involved. Um, in these kind of challenges, the boot camps, the hackathons, uh, the iLiving Labs, and so on. Um, we also reached about uh, more than 250 what we called entrenovators, educators, entrepreneurs, researchers, innovators. We really try to uh, bring them closely together, uh, the managers, uh, the stakeholders. Um, so far, we uh, addressed uh, more than 80 regional challenges, and more than 20 startups uh, really benefited. Uh, from UDRES, these numbers are growing and growing. Um, and yeah, our learned lessons uh, so far um, really focus on talents, strengthens and opportunities, not on the barriers, not on the problems. The European approach always starts with the problem, always with the barriers. We should really promote uh, the opportunities and the talents. Um, we need collaboration. We have to turn voices, learn from and with each other rather than compete. I think everyone says this, but still there's a lot of competition out there. Um, we have to enable uh, ideas rather than enforce um, academic performance. Um, enabling, empowering people I think is key, but we still look just on these usually very narrow defined KPIs. Um, and of course we have to interact engaged and entrepreneurial with various stakeholders out there, engaged and entrepreneurial. There are still so many people who really think this is uh, somehow competing. You either uh, support the, the society or you support uh, the economy. And if you work too closely with the economy, then uh, this is, uh, you, you can't uh, have the academic freedom. At least to my opinion, this is bullshit. If you want to change the world, you need both engagement and entrepreneurial thinking, otherwise you will be left behind. And last sentence, 
Um, I said uh, the, I, I had to look on, on the um, uh, innovation ecosystems in, in the US. Um, and of course, Stanford and Berkeley and MIT and so on, they are well, very well connected to these companies uh, today that really have an impact on our society, um, if we like this or not. Um, and we should really think in our universities that most of these leaders do not even have a degree from a university. Um, yes, they are connected to Stanford. Yes, they are connected to Berkeley, but they have no degree. Um, I think we have to think about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Hannes. <laughs> Thanks. For that. It's interesting. I think you can see that there are different types of institutions involved in the in the alliances, and what is interesting about this initiative for me is that it involves the whole institution, or should do, whereas a lot of Erasmus projects and other European projects before often are only targeted at uh, individual uh, departments or even individuals. And uh, th this really is about institutional cooperation and uh, allows people to analyse the, the strengths and weaknesses of their own um, institutions. So thank you very much to all four of you. Um, as I said, uh, I'm hoping, even though we're, we're towards the end of the conference, that there will be some questions for the panellists. Uh, and like the other moderator said, if there isn't, then unfortunately you'll get mine. So, um, who's going to start? <coughs> Don't be shy. Yes, over there, you're first. Hi, I'm Sarah Morton, I think, as most of you know now. Um, I'm really interested the way this conversation is moving towards a new different kind of university and what that new different kind of university might look like. And I just wondered if any of the panelists would like to reflect on what are the core changes that you think need to happen to business as usual, either in research or teaching, to move to this new entangled university, I love that term, I think it was a great term for kind of multi-connected university, but what, what are the key big blocks, the big, big blocks that are going to have to shift? What does that actually look like? Sorry, it's a difficult no, question. Good one. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we, you, you can all have a go at answering that one. Start with you, Igor, shall we? Well, it's connected, yeah. Well, I think, um, can you see me? Yeah. No? No. no. Okay. Just, just, just really speak think, loud. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, well, there is a, a, a need of change of the mindset of the. Okay. Now, yes, yes. So thank you. Uh, so I think that the, the, what we need is to to change the the mindset at the different levels that we have at the university. I think uh, it is not just. Uh, let's say the um, rectoral teams or the researchers or the staff, I think we need to have, I don't know how, to synchronize that change or that shift in the, in the mindset of the different, because I think there are a lot of mental barriers that then become institutional barriers for uh, giving place or to become a new way, a new uh, university. So I think that we need to, to change the, the full operating system of, of, of the university itself, not just to add something here or add something there, but to, to have this uh, global change. How this is done? Well, I don't know. I mean, you, you have to, 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 to undertake a, a holistic and complex uh, approach and uh, work uh, iteratively with the different uh, sub-communities that we have in the universities. And, and I think that's part of the pathway to, to, to move to a new stage of, of, of being. This is how I see it. Sorry, for being not so specific, but, you know. Yeah, good. What, Ernesto, would you like to? Yes, just to, uh, a few ideas. I, I, from my point of view, I think that anyway, within European universities or outside universities, we need to evolve, you know, we are in front of a huge revolution in our society, then uh, we need to, in some way, to cope with these new needs for, in particular, for example, for the students, we, we like to provide a student-centric approach, but 
can we do it? It's difficult inside one university, but when we have an ecosystem, here we are not talking in just mobility of students. We are really talking about providing, for example, to students a large learning path to develop whatever they want to do in education, entrepreneurship, or research, for example. And I think these, these kind of ecosystems are fantastic. It's a huge opportunity for universities to transform themselves with the help of the, this collective intelligence that we are working together to get these, these goals. Oh, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, I echo, of course, what was said, but I think that it's such a long-term process, and we already hear. Uh, we talk about agents of change. Uh, we we are contributing to providing talent and expertise to people that will be able to change. I think and transform the systems um, as we speak. And I think one of the advantages of alliances is the way we work with external members to universities and the, the share of knowledge and approach and bottom-up approach, listening to what uh, local entities um, within the ecosystem have to say. And I think that is, can only be beneficial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, from my point of view, of course, very, very difficult question, and if I would have an answer, then that probably would be a rich man or something <laughs> like that. Um, just let me mention some things. Of course, there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of research out there going on on, on uh, future skills. For instance, uh, they, this will shape uh, universities, um, uh, new new culture, you know, new mindsets, and so on. I, I would. Uh, just say the most important thing is don't be afraid about new developments. Mm -hmm. uh, just just go for it. And and I would come with just simple examples from uh, let's from the music industry, because higher education mainly is affected by the digital transformation. What happened to the music industry back in the 1980s and 90s uh, was uh, first of all do it yourself people were able to produce their records on their own. And this is what is happening right now already. There are a lot of companies out there who do not ask the universities for educating uh, their stuff. They do it on their own. And also people do this already uh, on their own, not always with success. This is maybe one reason why we have so many fake news and, and so on, but uh, it already works. Um, don't be afraid about it because we can't stop this uh, anymore. Um, and so we have this do-it-yourself. Also in the music industry, back in the 1980s and 70s, the main uh, aspect of the, the record stores and, and so on was produce an album with a very unique sound, a very unique even story, a concept behind this full album. And people bought this, get home, uh, listen to this record for more than an hour, maybe switching off the light. This, of course, does not happen anymore in, in our time. Um, now we have all these fast foods, just three minute uh, bits, bits and pieces. Maybe this is the reason why we now talk since a couple of years about micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. um, and some things are wrong, but on the other hand, this is the way you have to do it today. Mm -hmm. and don't be afraid about it, because if you go back to the music industry, uh, the vinyl is coming back. Uh, just uh, some, some weeks ago, uh, there was the message uh, today was uh, in the US, more vinyl records are sold than uh, compact discs again, and this is a, a again growing number. So these things will survive. Of course, we also have uh, a bachelor, master, PhD degrees even in, in 10 or 15 years. Although, although there are some rectors on one of these things which say, no, we will, won't have this mm -hmm. um, in the future. I think we will have, but uh, other things as well. And we have to uh, integrate this and definitely not be afraid of them. Yeah, so did that answer your question? Yeah? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, to summarize, I mean, innovation in education. Um, I mean, I know we talk a lot about research. Um, in this conference, but innovation in education is one of the big uh, uh, results and uh, benefits of this initiative, and which is why, for example, British uh, universities who are p associate partners now, because we're, uh, Britain is outside the Erasmus programme, are so desperate to stay in the alliances. It's not for the money, 
but it's to learn uh, about these, uh, uh, these innovative um, trends. So thank you for that. Um, the, another one here, gentleman in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was um, uh, listening to the stories, and the last story was also very much about entrepreneurship. Um, now, I'm coincidentally a professor of entrepreneurship and have been working on a university for a very long time before the current university where I work, which calls itself uni the Entrepreneurial University. Uh, that's the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And, um, I wonder a bit about the Enlight. Uh, uh, what is the, the entrepreneurialism here? Uh, because uh, I, I, I must agree with uh, some of the things you just said. I think uh, there is a... There is a there are major shifts going on, possibly. Uh, those are opportunities, but also threats uh, to our, uh, to our uh, existing universities. So how do we bring in entrepreneurship in the Enlight uh, network? Okay. For you. Okay. Now, I think you can hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> well, we have, first of all, um, what do we understand by entrepreneurship? Because if we understand entrepreneurship just by creating new companies, I must say that we don't have a focus on that right now, right now, okay? So, but if we think in entrepreneurship in a broader uh, sense of this terminology, I think uh, we are being a very entrepreneurial because I think one of the, one of the aspects that I was thinking after the Sarah's uh, uh, question was that how we are considering students, for example. We are not considering students as, let's say, consumers of education. We are considering them as part of the process of knowledge creation, okay? So for me, this is very entrepreneurial, for example. Although it is not leading to create new uh, companies based on technology, this is changing the mindsets of students, moving from, let's say, consumers of education to be prosumers of, uh, of education and knowledge. So I think this is the way in which we are addressing uh, entrepreneurship, by uh, putting the challenges at the very core of every activity that we are undertaking either education, which I think uh, is at the very core of, of, uh, of Enlight, the challenge-based model that we want to install by uh, developing living labs uh, under, uh, within those uh, five flagship domains that uh, Guido mentioned yesterday, Ch challenge-driven common uh, research agendas by uh, installing different, um, uh, but by activating the quadruple helix in each of our uh, surroundings of each university and connecting them, either through the regional academies or through the uh, Enlightened Innovation District. So I think we are being very much entrepreneurial, although we are not having a focus on you know, creating new businesses. We expect, and this is an expectation, that out of that, uh, we will have you know, uh, globally engaged citizens and that they will be also creating new business opportunities, maybe social business opportunities, maybe any other kind of opportunities. So I think we are very much entrepreneurial, not in the narrow sense, mm. but in the broader sense, yes. Yes, I think, does that satisfy you? Not completely, but, <laughs> but, but you are a professor of entrepreneurship and I would guess uh, that you would never be satisfied and there'll be plenty of time to continue the conversation uh, in, the, in the future. But, um, you know, uh, I would agree with you about the wide definition of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Well, I do agree with the broader definition, let me be clear. Yes. Uh, however, about 10% of the population is entrepreneurial in a more narrow sense. Mm -hmm. and we have how many students in Enlight? 300,000 and 50 so students, more or less. 000, uh, yeah. uh -huh. I, I would put some attention to that Tomorrow. a little bit more uh, yeah. explicit. Yeah. Well, I think we have a, you know, a long-term roadmap ahead of us, and I am sure that in the next stages of our uh, alliance, we will be incorporating more and more activities, particularly those that can be considered as a launch path for entrepreneurial uh, adventures in the you know, narrow sense of the uh, of the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hannes wants to say something. Just, just wanting to, uh, to, from my perspective, of course, I can't answer for uh, in light, but I think um, <laughs> this one aspect about the entrepreneurship are dealing with spin-off startups, making out businesses from, from research um, outputs. So this mm. is the more or less obvious thing. We talked about University of the Future. We, uh, I mentioned future skills. One 
highly important future skill, of course, is entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. This is not, not necessarily means that you have to be an entrepreneur for sure, but we need this kind of thinking. Yeah. If we ask ourselves why is Europe lacking behind US and China, mm -hmm. there is not so much difference if, if in, in terms uh, of fundamental research. Um, we can compete uh, with, with those, uh, but they are much faster. And, mm -hmm. and so we need this kind of entrepreneurial thinking um, and, and have this somehow uh, in, in almost all our <coughs> curricula yeah. uh, as, as we ne need to write or, uh, and, 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 and to speak and, and to present uh, entrepreneurship and creativity. I think these are key and, and not in the end of the innovation, uh, but uh, on the very, very beginning. Means, I think this yeah. is important and this is a uh, very, very, uh, it is not simple to do, of no. course. That, that's a good answer. I think people have misunderstood the term entrepreneurial university, that it's all about spin-offs and startups, and it's not. Um, uh, and uh, we can see that here uh, from the answers. Um, anyone else? Yeah, at the back. Thank you, Stefan de Jong, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Um, I would like to raise the issue of the geographical dimension of impact, and by extension, who gets to benefit from everything that we do. And it was triggered by uh, the definition of impact in and light, which mentioned global. And this is what I often see in university strategies, global. That's the aim. Then the behavior is aimed at local incubators, uh, increasing the links with City Hall. Um, so what are we going to do to make sure that we can also have a global impact? Um, but then Hannes focused on regional impact. I think a lot of great examples, but what does that then mean? for those communities who live in orphan regions, regions without universities. Um, so what are the trade-offs between going for a global or a regional local impact? Another good question. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, 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 I can uh, start maybe. Um, we really, first of all, start in the region, and we think small is beautiful. So for instance, we did one of our boot camps in a very, very small village in the Austrian Alps, far away from everywhere. Even <coughs> if you come from Austria, you have to take uh, three hours at least, or five hours drive from, from Vienna, for instance, to reach this uh, little village. But when you are there, you are there, and it's much more intense uh, uh, experience and, and so on. And you really meet these local communities uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is kind of new experience. The, the students and, and also the colleagues who, who had this experience said this, this was really some kind of mind changing. Um, and this is good. But of course we can't stop there. And, and that's why we have this pan-European new uh, network uh, where we try to share these things. Uh, coming out from this small global thing to a small regional thing to a, and, and try to make it bigger, bigger, bigger um, to a first national, then European, and then maybe uh, international or global uh, thing. Uh, we are on this, on this way, but I think we have to start. Uh, we have to do things. We have to push uh, limits and not, not just wait. Start with the opportunities, and the opportunities, there are so many. Just open the door, go out, mm -hmm. and you have your opportunities, and try to create impact, mm -hmm. um, and then scale up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think that that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say that the response as well would be to actually ask the local people with whom we're working what they would imagine, to really take their perspective and, and dialogue and uh, because I think with the EC2 Alliance at least there's differences and the similarities but we have to adapt to the differences, we have to adapt to the similarities to then be able to come up with local <coughs> solutions but also globally adapted ones and it needs to be bottom up and not just top down mm -hmm. from a global perspective I think, if that mm -hmm. answers the question mm -hmm. <laughs> in any way. Ernesto? <coughs> yeah, yes, I think that uh, for example in, in, the in the case of our Alliance UNITA we are not uh, focusing geographic impact is more community mm. impact. And for us, community, as I presented, is Romans language countries, and we are creating this community uh, in Europe and also beyond. Then uh, our goal, long-term goal, our impact that we expect is to 
uh, allow these communities to work together. But uh, the problem that we have all of us is how you can uh, fund that economically, because there is there, there, is there a need for resources to develop that to long term. What we are doing is uh, structurally we are, uh, uh, let's say, building the communities based on what we have already. For example, uh, my university will have three, four, five, six partners in Africa and in South America. Then these partners are my friends, are going to be the friends of my other university. Then we are creating this network uh, uh, of uh, uh, universities that are going to be connected to their ecosystems, local and national ecosystems, and we expect that this, at the long term, is going to <clears throat> start having students uh, studying in this ecosystem, researchers working in this ecosystem, and of course, given uh, given result outcomes and impact to their uh, local ecosystems. But it is is complex because we are working in, in project-oriented approach for three years and four years, and it, it technically is not really easy. I don't know my colleagues how do they think, but to decide about everything, entrepreneurship, mm. linguistic, education, mm. research. I mean, <laughs> this is a university. All the missions mm. of the universities need to be uh, involved. Then it is not easy. But if we think structurally on the, uh, let's say, the architecture of the communities, uh, we think that we're going to be able to, to have this geographic impact. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I would like to say two, two things to the, to the question because I think it's a very good question. And I would like to answer first from a more maybe research perspective, which I think it is your background. Uh, and then I would like to, to say something about Enlight. So first of all, I, I, I do agree with you. When, when dealing with impact, we always think in terms of the temporal dimension, you know. Uh, impact, uh, you have to consider the time frame. It is short term, long term. You know, but I think the spatial, the geographical dimension is very important because science, on the one hand, is a global endeavor. Okay, so one discovery happens in one place, but it doesn't. You cannot assure that the, let's say, the innovation related to that discovery is going to be, you know, developed in that particular place. Maybe it is the research is done here in Europe, and then. It is in, the, in California where the innovation-related activity that will make a business out of it is happening. So somehow you cannot establish, you know, you cannot ensure by betting for your system that you will have the return in your system as well. So, okay, this is one, uh, one thing. And the same with education, because you are educating students, but talent is moving, you know, all over the world. So the students that you are educating in your, your university, you cannot ensure that they will, that you will have a return in your region because you have educated those students, because they will move to China, they will move to the United States, they will move to another country. So we have to be very mm. much aware of this uh, situation when we want to somehow have the return of the investment that we are doing when we consider the, the, the impact that we are generating both in education and research. This is one part of the, of, the, of, the, of the, not the answer, the comment to your question, because I don't think this answers your question. And in particular, in, in the case of Enlight, we have what we call a multi-scale approach, okay? So every university can be considered as a sort of, of, of a hub. A hub for the region because establish a lot of different connections with the <coughs> stakeholders in the region, but it is also a hub for international relationships. So we play with the concept of network of networks. Each university is internationalized, it's very much international, it has a lot of different connections, and with by connecting the different networks, international networks that each university has. We don't ensure, but we are leading to have a broader impact that just acting uh, regionally. So somehow this multi-scale approach that uh, we have adopted within Enlight, I think, well, is leading to, 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 to solve that problem, although it doesn't ensure that we will be successful with that. Okay. Look, I'm under strict orders to finish the panel uh, discussion uh, at uh, 12.30 because we have the VIPs, let's say, to, to close the conference. Um, but I, so I don't think I can get any more questions. Uh, I just think it was a good question to finish on. 
because this uh, issue of uh, using the international knowledge for the benefit of the region is, is something that, th that this could be the hallmark of the initiative. I think the focus on transnational cooperation, the European degree, uh, and so on, there's a risk that it does distract us from doing that, and certainly I'm, it's something that I'm v uh, close to my heart, is the regional impact of higher education, and I've, I've, I've also made this clear to the European Commission that this is a danger, you know, this is a European initiative, so although we do want ivory towers, we, we, we don't want it to be seen as something that doesn't work for uh, the citizens. Uh, you know, uh, it's not just a big higher education party. Uh, at least I think that's uh, what it shouldn't be, that's my view. So, all that remains to, uh, for me to say is to thank you very much for participating. I've really enjoyed moderating this session. I think everyone has uh, got something out of this and all the, the nice chats we've had over the, over the dinners and it's been a wonderful conference and a, a great welcome. So thank you, Igor. Thank you to all. See you soon. I think we have to...